Welcome into Candlestick Chronicles, a 49ers podcast on the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Kyle Matz, and I write about the 49ers over at NinersWire.com, part of the USA Today Sports Media Group. He's Chris Peterman, and we are going to talk to you about 49ers training camp and some other NFL contract stuff going on uh, around the league that could impact the 49ers. But before we do that, Chris, talk to us about our homies over at Lamb Chops. As you know, if you've listened to the podcast for a while, you are fully aware that uh, the official uniform provider of this podcast Mm -hmm. is lamb chops follow them on instagram at sg lamb chops go to sg lamb chops.com pro and use promo code candlestick 20 for a generous 20 percent off of your first order Uh, right now i'm wearing some lamb chops joggers slash sweatpants extremely comfortable it's a little cooler in sacramento these days so going with uh going with the sweatpants tonight instead of the shorts which are obviously awesome very comfortable very practical um very stylish so if you have not checked out lamb chops check them out sglambchops.com follow on instagram at sglambchops and if you order anything from them use promo code candlestick 20 for 20 percent off your order we would highly recommend it yes couldn't recommend it more we're also sponsored by prize picks i know that we do prize picks on this show during football season But there are sports outside of football, it turns out. Baseball, basketball, the summer games are going on right now. My girl Asia Wilson of the Las Vegas Aces going to work for the United States women's basketball team. You know I'm rocking with her all the time in prize picks. And if you're like, hey, this is the first time I'm ever listening to the ads on this program. What is prize picks? Well, let me tell you. It's daily fantasy sports and it's super easy. You pick two to six players. On the prize picks app, you pick two to six players, you pick more or less on their stat projections, and then you, you can turn a hundred bucks into like a thousand bucks. It's that easy. It is so much fun. It has greatly enhanced the way I watch sports, and I know it'll do the same for you. So use promo code candlestick at prizepicks.com slash candlestick, or download the prize picks app and use promo code candlestick for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. That is promo code candlestick for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars dollars prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy all right let's talk training camp and contracts here we go i like once training camp gets to pats that's where i feel like i can actually start to have i I can actually form my hard opinions on things once pads are on i don't care about pass rushers and offensive linemen and what receivers are doing and what linebackers are doing when nobody's getting hit. It's a fundamental part of the sport, Chris. Yeah, I think that's (laughs) totally fair. Uh, I think overall, and we, we see there, there's always this back and forth on like social media, football, football people in particular are saying every year, it's like, Oh man, the overreactions to training camp are out of control. And then the other side of it is, Oh man, they're, we're, we're coming off months without football. Like this is this is you know this is great. We're we're loving every second of it. Um, it's just tra- training camp is what it is to me. Like, mm-hmm. and I, I think you know that that leads into the conversation about Brock Purdy throwing. You know, we're recording this Tuesday night. Brock Purdy's thrown seven interceptions in the last two days. Uh, I think he threw four in his last five throws, according to the reporters who were there on, at Tuesday's practice. You and I are going to be there on Sunday, so we will have a, a fresh wait. perspective next week um, for our listeners. But I just like that there's always context, right, when it when it comes to training camp interceptions. First of all, it's July 30th and it's training camp. I think that's probably the most important bit of context here the other bit of context the 49ers are not game planning um and they've had offensive players in and out of the lineup throughout i know on monday when brock Purdy threw three interceptions i think christian mccaffrey george kittle um ricky pearsall uh were not practicing right he was jacob cowing Mm -hmm. so you could say you know brock Purdy was without four of his top five receivers he's obviously been without trent williams who's holding out um over contract stuff and yeah, there's no game planning. And and the other thing that's worth pointing out that probably doesn't get enough attention is the fact that defenses are usually usually ahead of the offense this time of year. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens the 49ers also potentially have one of the best defenses in the NFL. And mm-hmm. I think if you were the way 
training camp is talked about, I think particularly from a 49ers perspective over the last few years, or whether it's media or podcasters or whatever, it's always about, well, the quarterback threw three picks. You can look at it the other way and say the defense intercepted three passes, right? You could say, mm-hmm. like, if we looked at it from a different point of view, you could say, man, the Niners defense is locked in. Like, maybe Nick Sorensen is just doing a hell of a job. Maybe Brandon mm-hmm. Staley is really making an impact in a positive way, right? And we we obviously have no idea. It's still July. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's two sides to every coin. And the 49ers, we know, has a really good defense, and defense is often ahead of the offense at this time of the year. So mm-hmm. um, there is going to be a tendency of everyone to overreact when there are interception numbers. I know there's been, you know, Brock Purdy threw a bunch of interceptions in training camp last year. Turned out to have a pretty good season, and it wasn't all that uh, all that meaningful uh, looking back. So I'm expecting something similar to happen. Um, again, like it's it's hard to really come to any strong conclusions um, in, during the first you know week and a half of training camp, mm-hmm. where we can turn on the first. Anyway we can turn on the first preseason game and be like, Oh man, that was some ugly football. It's like, yeah, it's a preseason. That's what right. it is. Well, this right. is before the preseason, like long before mm-hmm. the preseason. So uh, anything, anything less or you know, anything like this is just unsurprising to me. Like I would be more surprised if it was like, Oh man, Brock Purdy threw five touchdowns and no picks in red zone. And um, even without all of his weapons and even without Trent Williams, like that would be like, okay, like that's, mm-hmm. that's interesting. But Brock Purdy getting picked, picked a bunch while those guys are in and out of the lineup and you know obviously the the offense is going to be a very vanilla form of itself like i'm not i'm not trying i'm trying not to make too much of it we'll see like it's fair if this stuff happens in games preseason games or regular season games Mm -hmm. and it's like all right then maybe Mm -hmm. the training camp stuff was something but until then brock Purdy is a benefit of the doubt for me i don't all of a sudden think he sucks yeah man i'm i'm right there with you uh i i do think that in (laughs) I don't think that it's a complete nothing burger to the point that there's there's two extremes to this. There's everything's a disaster. Brock Purdy has thrown seven interceptions in the 49ers' first two padded practices. Oh my God, the sky is falling. That's ridiculous. There's the other side of the coin that's like, nothing to see here. Everything is great. Brock Purdy is awesome. Look at all the good plays he made. That's also kind of ridiculous. But I think on that, on that, on that scale, like the, the giant gray area in between those two extremes, I would lean more toward the, the first thing because it's not, it's not good. Like throwing interceptions is, is an inherently bad thing, regardless of the setting, right? So I don't want to make this out to be like, hey, everything is good. Brock Purdy is awesome. But you're right. He does get the benefit of the doubt from me. But on the second day of this, where he finishes practice with four interceptions, I think it was in his last five throws, that just, that perks my ears up. That's two days in a row that that's been a thing. Uh, but also, I think context matters a lot in situations like that. Context always matters. But I'm sorry, if Brock Purdy throws 10 interceptions in practice and every single one of them hit his receiver right between the numbers and it went for an interception. that Okay, that's bad for the receiver, but I'm not going to be like, oh my God, Brock Purdy threw all these interceptions. It's going to be a huge problem. So I'm I'm monitoring it. I've got an eye on it, but it doesn't sound like from everything I'm I'm reading in the the coverage of it, uh, there's nothing that makes me think, wow, Brock Purdy just doesn't get the offense anymore or... Man, he's just not seeing X, Y, and Z. He's made the same mistake time and time again. Like, no, it's got – here's one, it's bouncing off a receiver's hands. One, it's like a slide overthrow on a deep ball. Another one is uh, he he threw an errant, errant pass because he was under pressure. Like, yeah, you're probably, you're probably not going to do that in a game. So I don't I don't have it in me to, to care that much. I think it's something worth keeping an eye on because you don't want the, the quarterback throwing a ton of interceptions day in and day out. You're hoping that, hey, okay, he's going to make these mistakes in practice and eventually he starts to learn from them and starts eliminating and starts eliminating those mistakes. But for now, I'm just... I, and the other thing that, that jumps out to me is I know he had three on Monday and one of them was, was Logan Thomas, but then who he's not played with before. And another one was Braden Willis, who he has not got a ton of burn with. 
and there's no Brandon Ayuk. And you, you said it earlier, there's no game planning. It's the defenses kind of knowing what the offense is doing. I, I, I don't, it's not nothing, but it's also, it, it's, it's not enough to give me any sort of, of pause at all. I, 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 yeah. I think calling it, I think if we got on here and went, nothing to see here, everything fine, Brock Purdy's awesome, I think that's disingenuous, but at the same time, I also don't think that it's worth getting on here and being like, oh my god, disaster. It's just a thing that happened. Like, what what do we talk about every year with the Niners? It's that Losing. they tend to, tend to play, oh. <laughs> they tend to play their best football in November and December, yeah. right? It, there's a ramp up that that like a, exactly. a prolonged ramp up that this exactly. that this takes. So the fact that Brock Purdy is, you know, playing in pads this week for the first time since the Super Bowl and the offense doesn't sound like it's looking that great. I mean that that shouldn't really be a surprise to anybody. So no. yeah, I think that's the context. I think I would be honestly if like I would be more concerned like if Brock Purdy was lighting up the Niners the Niners defense I'd be like, what's going on with the Niners' defense? Why is the Niners' defense like, mm. so bad in training camp? Did you hear? Hey, speaking <laughs> of that, just real quick, I guess this fits in the takeaways category. Do you see what Diamondor Lenore said about Kyle Shan uh, about Brandon Staley? He's a genius. Yeah, he said it's like having Kyle Shanahan on defense. Like, man, he was a, I think he said that to KMBR. He was a really good. Um, a really good coordinator with the Rams that one year. Like he, he had, I believe he had one year as a coordinator before he got a head coaching job. Yeah. I so. liked that the, uh, one of the critiques that, that I had certainly of Brandon Staley because his, his head coaching tenure with the chargers was kind of a mess. Their defense was never good. And that caused some revisionist history. Again, I'm just going to blame me on this. I know other people had the take too, but I, I'm just going to just put the spotlight on myself here. It was, all of a sudden the revisionist history of, well, that defense also had prime Aaron Donald and prime Jalen Ramsey. Maybe it wasn't state, but he figured out how to have a great defense with those guys. And now he's going to be helping out Nick Sorensen on a defense that was arguably, arguably more talented than those Rams teams. Definitely deeper. Yeah. So I think, I think like is Kevin Givens can basically be Aaron Donald, <laughs> right? Are we all on board with this? If Daniel Brunskill can be the uh, the Aaron Donald <laughs> topper, then Kevin Givens can certainly hey, be Aaron Donald. <laughs> did you did you see what Chris Forster said about Daniel Brunskill? What he said? He said that the reason so Brunskill played with Chris Hubbard last year in Tennessee. Chris Hubbard started, I think, nine games at right tackle for for the Titans. The 49ers signed Chris Hubbard this offseason. And Chris Forster basically said they signed him because Kyle Shanahan called Dan Brunskill, who's one of his faves, and went, hey, can this dude play for our offense and play in our offense? And Dan Brunskill was like, for show. And Shanny's like, we need him then. He got the Danny Bruns co-sign, get this guy in the building. I mean, who doesn't love Daniel Brunskill? <laughs> and that's not even a bit. Like, I, he's like one of the nicest guys I, I've I've covered and talked to. Like, he's he's great. So our guy, look, here's Nick Wagner covers the 49ers for ESPN. Does a great job. Uh, lights up when you talk about Danny Bruns. Yeah, big Danny yeah. Bruns guy. And Wagner's not the only guy. Go, you're the only person. Go check. Go check Danny Bruns. Instagram. He seems like he's doing just fine. Doing great. <laughs> we love it for our guy. <laughs> we love it for our guy. Um, but no, we're not. So we're not overreacting to training. Now, if he does it in front of in front of us when we go when we go to training camp on Sunday, um, you know, maybe then we'll we'll feel a little more a little bit more reactionary. But if Brock now, Purdy throws more than two interceptions on Sunday. I'm walking off that field doing a selfie video, absolutely lambasting him <laughs> and wondering why Josh Dobbs isn't starting for this team. Going to chart every throw. <laughs> what, hey, would you call that intermediate or deep? <laughs> I did, he he should have went to his third read there. I don't know. <laughs> Cause is he, is he just hey, not progression seeing as much? <laughs> is he just not seeing it? Take take the check down. <laughs> I do this in Madden all the time. Brock, come here. 
<laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> um, well, speaking of Brock Purdy, I, I do think it's worth discussing the quarterback deals that got done last week since we last recorded this podcast. Um, you had Tua Tonga Vailoa sign a four year, $212.4 million extension with the Dolphins of Miami. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jordan Love with the Packers signed a four year, $22 million contract. $220 million. Four years, $22 million would be fucking. Nuts. Or, yeah, four years, $220 <laughs> million. Yeah, my apologies. Um, but these guys are now making. Jordan Love's making $55 million a year on average, and Tua's making 53.1. Mm-hmm. So I think the, the common line of thinking here is probably that Brock Purdy is going to be making $55 million a year, at least next year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, like, I personally, I would feel a hell of a lot better about paying Jordan Love that money because I think Jordan Love is the type of guy who can elevate an offense not really be like a cog running it Mm -hmm. right and i think that sets a table for a really interesting year for brock purdy because i think you would find people like a like a the same number of people on both sides of that argument regarding brock right like people Mm -hmm. would say his detractors would say well yeah he functions within kyle shanahan's offense at a really high level but you could probably approximate that with somebody else who's not making $55 million a year because Mm -hmm. of how good the scheme is and how good the supporting cast is. And I think there are other people that would say, no, you like one of the reasons why the 49ers offense is so efficient is because Brock Purdy is really, really good at processing and going to the right place and being accurate and getting the ball out quickly and those things. And maybe that's not super replicable. Replicable. I would lean more towards the Jordan Love side with Brock Purdy because I think there's a there's an element of his game that we saw in the playoffs last year, particularly when he's scrambling around and making plays with his legs, like mm-hmm. in crucial situations and got to have it situations in the playoffs. And it's like, oh, if he's just going to go get the play out or go get the first down outside of structure, no matter what, mm-hmm. that's that is a franchise type dude that you're comfortable paying Mm -hmm. at the top of the market more so than you know Tua who goes to Kansas City and the weather's cold and all of a sudden can't even function right so I think the point here and and I don't know how much expounding we need to do on this because um, we got plenty of time to talk about Brock Purdy's extension and hopefully it doesn't get drawn out like Mm -hmm. this Brandon I thing has but um there's there's a pretty realistic chance that we're looking at a fifty five to sixty million dollar a year contract for Brock Purdy next offseason. Seems like it. I don't know. I've been saying sixty, just offhand. I think you would have to win the Super Bowl to get there. That's that's kind of where I've I've landed and part of part of the the one of the the aspects of this is that's going to matter is what the Cowboys do with Dak Prescott and what Dak Prescott's eventual deal looks like. It doesn't sound like he's going to get one this year and maybe they make a big run and he's awesome and they go and uh, pay him a bunch of money. But I don't, the fact that neither Tua nor Jordan love reset the market with their deals. I don't, I don't think that that necessarily means that that Brock is all of a sudden going to start making 60. And if they do decide that that he's going to reset the market from an from an APY standpoint and, and or an AAV standpoint is the acronym I use, average annual value. If they do decide that he's going to reset the market f- there, I think you'd be looking at like 55 and a half million per year or 56 million per year. I don't think it's necessarily going to jump from 55 to 60. So I think that would partly be contingent on if a Dak Prescott deal gets done, what that looks like. Because if he takes a market to 57 or 58, then maybe Brock goes and resets it at 60. But I think the, the Jordan Love contract is a is a is probably a pretty good starting starting point for, for Brock Purdy and his camp. And this season will be about adding additional dollars to that based on his performance. 
Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, there are a couple of different ways to do it. Um, I think those contracts were created in with different structures, right? And obviously the structure, you, you and I both know how important the structure is. Um, oh, it is it the big key, big NFL contracts. Um, but, you know, is it going to be one of those deals where it's a bunch of fake money and um, Niners can get out of it easily uh, if they need to? That's to be determined. I think a lot of that, you know, like a, a lot of the structure of the contract and how easy it is to get out of depends on how Brock Purdy plays this year in my opinion like if it's if it's a scenario where Brock Purdy regresses and he's not an MVP candidate and the 49ers are you know not quite clearly the dominant team of the conference like they were for so much of last season then the conversation becomes kind of interesting it's like man do do you pay Brock Purdy is this is this the guy that you want to be or is Brock Purdy going to be what he was or better than last year and then you're like yeah 60 million dollars like that's that's it i kind of um, think I, I, I kind of think if let's say there's some form of regression this year, maybe he throws a few more interceptions, uh, a couple of his uh, scrambles on third downs turn into sacks and whatever. I think the two a deal is like a floor. Yeah. I don't think there's any world where all of a sudden they're getting Brock Purdy for 40 million a year. Yeah, Brock's already won what four playoff games. Four. And two has never won one? I think he's like third among active quarterbacks in playoff wins. It's kind of wild. That's kind of nuts. I don't know if that's right. I made up that number off the top of my head, but now I'm going to devote time on the podcast to looking it up. You say something. <laughs> well, if we could guess players with more <laughs> playoff wins than him, I would say... Mahomes. Um, Mahomes. Oh, Rodgers. Josh Allen. Rodgers. Uh, uh, Lamar? Goff? I don't think no. Lamar doesn't. Lamar doesn't have more. Oh yeah. Maybe Lamar Jackson right. has two playoff wins. Well, Brock is as quick as Lamar, so I guess no, we it's shouldn't good point. be entirely yeah, shocked. That's a good point. Burrow. I guess we should. Burrow went to the Super Bowl, and I th- and the NFC champ. I think Burrow has has at least four. I'm looking um, this up now. Okay. <laughs> this is one of those things that if we were a proper podcast, we would have prepared for this. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, Joe Burrow has five playoff wins. Okay. I think the point here, though, is that like this is one of the things that makes Brock pretty unique relative to the rest of the league. The fact that he has four mm-hmm. playoff wins and he's been a starter for not even two full seasons. Mm-hmm. It's basically been a season and a half. And you know, the Niners could have gone to the Super Bowl if not for an elbow injury. That was kind of a freak thing. And they nearly won the Super Bowl with Brock Purdy in, during his first full season as a starter. So that's mm-hmm. pretty valuable. And we see the great lengths the 49ers have gone to when they don't have a franchise quarterback. Um, that maybe just having one is worth is worth the money to them, even if it means um, having to trim, trim some – you know, spending on the roster elsewhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, that's that's what's probably the most interesting thing about the Purdy contract is just like, what's the team look like when you're paying Brock Purdy sixty million dollars a year? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's, I think that's part of the the calculus with the Brandon Ayuk thing. Yeah, is the Niners don't have a ton of wiggle room now to go way above. You know, they can't just willy nilly go. Yeah, hey, here's thirty a year, or whatever, whatever Ayuk wants, uh, because they have to factor in a quarterback that's going to be making upwards of sixty million dollars a year, which is not something they've had to deal with. It, even even Jimmy Garoppolo, when Jimmy Garoppolo signed his deal, it was the highest. Uh, he was the highest paid quarterback in the league at five years, one hundred and thirty seven and a half. It was like twenty eight and a half million, I think. Which is just nutty. And very quickly, two years later, that was like a bargain for a for a starting NFL quarterback. So they've not the Niners haven't had to really deal with this problem. And I say problem; it's all relative. Every every team would love to have to to pay a, a franchise quarterback, but um, 
that's still kind of the question I have with with Purdy, frankly. It's just what does this look like when, okay, removing Debo Samuel from the equation. Okay, now it's two years later, George Kittle has been removed from the equation. Okay, now it's three years later, Christian McCaffrey is just not quite Christian McCaffrey anymore. Trent Williams has hung up his pads, he's done. Mm-hmm. When this is a team that has gone from an A plus group of skill position players, and maybe they replenish the the roster and they have an A plus group of skill position players still in this moot point, but what happens if that group of players around Brock Purdy is a B minus? Can he make them look like an A? And right. I, I that's a question I'm going to have until he does it, and maybe he never needs to do it. But uh, that's that's kind of the big thing. But I also don't. I'm not going to sit here on this podcast and advocate for not paying Brock Purdy at or near the top of the market. Yeah, there's no world. The the production's there. I mean yeah. that, and he's done everything that you know you would want of him to, to do to prove that he's a winning quarterback. And the, the the thing we can you can have your thoughts if if you're listening to this and you're saying nope, would not pay Brock Purdy. That that's fine. That's that's your right to that opinion. And I, I think it's there's. Uh, validity to that if you if you want to if you want to make the argument uh the reality of the situation is is this is kyle shanahan's call and kyle shanahan likes brock purdy very very much i think the only really like if you want to knock brock purdy for not winning the super bowl last year that's fine my Hold counter to that to would fire. my counter to that would be all right well one guy has beaten patrick mahomes in the super bowl and it was Tom Brady, and it took the Chiefs' offensive line being being a complete sieve in that game for the Bucks to beat the Chiefs during the COVID Super Bowl. Easiest so, money I ever made, by the way. The Bucks were the obvious call. Bucks in the wild. under was just the <laughs> lightest work. Um, but I mean, to if your standard is this guy has to beat Patrick Mahomes, or you don't pay him. Um, then really the only quarterback in the league worth paying is Patrick Mahomes. And that's just not how that's just yeah. not how the league works. So um yeah, I would say, you know, I just I just think it's like Brock, Brock's it's gonna be a polarizing debate, I think. I think it there's going to be unless he lights it up this year and is better than he was last year. And mm-hmm. even if he's the same guy that he was last year, there's gonna be like, well, you know, you could you could Go get somebody else at half the price and get, you know, 85% of the value. And maybe that's true. I think. Go ahead. Sorry. But I, I just don't I, like I view this more on more towards the Jordan Love side of the spectrum where I think Jordan Love is really good and can potentially trans transcend scheme. Sure. Whereas I don't think Tua can do that. I think Tua has to be in that system. I think he needs Tyreek Hill. I think he needs ideal weather like Miami can provide. Sure. And I think he's going to have a hard time winning a Super Bowl, making that kind of money on that contract. I think last season debunked that myth from the 49ers standpoint. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on because that because uh, J- like all, all due respect to to Jimmy Garoppolo, Brock Purdy is markedly better. Like from an individual just playmaking standpoint, he made 20 plays perhaps last year that whatever iteration of Jimmy Garoppolo was playing quarterback for the 49ers at the end of his tenure there was not was not willing or capable of making. I don't know which one it is. And that would kind of be the reality that the 49ers were living in. Okay, you can let Brock Purdy go. Uh, let's see, who's on, the, who's on the free agent market? Trey Lance? Uh, <laughs> maybe Justin Fields? Oh, you want to go get Russell Wilson? You want to go track down Gardner Minshew? Like none of, none of those guys are, are making the 49ers markedly better. You want to go give Kirk Cousins a fully guaranteed contract? <laughs> God. Yeah. So that's that's just kind of where where okay yeah you want to you want to go bargain bin shopping at quarterback, and keep the band together. Cool. It's going to look a lot like it did with with Jimmy Garoppolo, and in a lot of cases, probably worse. In the Super Bowl, it felt like the Chiefs were taking it more advantage of Kyle Shanahan's play calling particularly on third down from Steve Spagnuolo than they were of Brock mm. Purdy's weaknesses. I would I would agree. The fact that Steve Spagnuolo tracked down Brock Purdy's phone number after the game to call him and be like, dude. That 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 said a lot to me. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was going to 
I was going to say something profane, but I don't think Steve Spagnuolo would have said that, so I didn't want to put words in his mouth. <laughs> uh, Dominic Pooney. Heck of a player. Getting getting some quality, some quality reviews from the reporters in camp. Or at camp, not in camp. At camp. Our um, guy... Our guy, Nick Wagner, second mention, had, I think the, as as he always does, the, I, I thought the, the fairest kind of most level-headed take on this whole thing, on the, on the Dominic Pony thing. And if you don't read Nick's recaps on Twitter, highly recommend doing so. It's at N Wagner. Uh, it, it's it's just a list of bullet points. Some of them are very short. Some of them are longer paragraphs, and it's it's really really insightful. Here's what he said about Dominic Pooney. Uh, Too early to say whether Pooney will win a starting job, but one thing we can comfortably conclude: he handles his business like a veteran. Just never looks uncomfortable, and has and has shown signs of understanding the little details like passing off blitzes and combo blocks in the run game, like someone well beyond his years. A strong start. So I think the caveat at the top there, too early to tell, is very important because it is. It's only July 30th. If we're going to say it's too early to say that Brock Purdy's interception stuff is a problem, then it's also too early to say whether Dominic Pooney is good or not. However, I will say it is an extremely good sign that it's two days in. And Nick's not the only reporter who has is, who is noticed how, how, how well he's playing. I just thought he put it really nicely and concisely. Uh, plus, we're contractually obligated to mention him on this podcast. <laughs> um, it, it's not just that that reporters have noted that he's good. It, it's it's the contrast to me from a guy like Aaron Banks, where Aaron Banks is a really good player now. He's a really high quality like fringe Pro Bowl starting guard in the NFL. And when you get that with a second round pick, that's a that's a win, right? But year one, you didn't hear about him in camp outside of he needs to reshape his body. He's not athletic enough. He can't do X, Y, and Z. It's all these reach blocks he's got to do and blah, 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 and that he that he just can't. And then he was inactive. He was a healthy scratch for seven of their first eight games, and then he got in and was active for the final nine games but played five snaps, and they were all in a blowout, went over Jacksonville. It was just a mess. It was a disaster rookie season for him, and then he's developed into a really nice player. The fact that that Pooney with John Feliciano dealing with a knee thing and Spencer Burford dealing with a, with a hand injury – that he has stepped in and gotten attention for being just quality right away, I think bodes really, really well for him to play a position that you and I have talked about ad nauseum on this podcast, has killed the 49ers in almost every big spot that they've been in. Yeah, and irrespective of, you know, what position he plays, if he could potentially, like, if he's looking like a guy who's who's just like a, a somebody you seem like you who could be reliable early on. Mm-hmm. Like, man, if he could play tackle and the 49ers ended up drafting Trent Williams replacement in the third round, like that would be a very, very big deal. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause Trent Williams is, you know, third going to be making $30 million a year or whatever. If, and when, you know, he renegotiates his contracts. <laughs> um, but the other thing I would point out too, there are a lot of people who love to be, um, extremely optimistic about players right just mm-hmm. like you, any nfl player you could look at um you know you could find numbers or anecdotes or advanced metrics or whatever and say yeah this is why they think he's going to be good like obviously guys get to the nfl for a reason but just because you get to the nfl for a reason because your tracking data said this this and this and your pass block or win rate said this this and this in college mm-hmm. doesn't always mean you're going to be good but you can mm-hmm. always track down that stuff because nobody who sucks in college makes it to the nfl that's just not how it works nope with nick in particular nick is very like nick is a tough a tough guy to please when it comes to being like de- determining if this player is good just a real asshole <laughs> no he's he's just <laughs> like he's appropriately skeptical yes like when yes. it comes to thousand percent when it comes to evaluating these guys and there's yes. so much fluff sometimes whether it's you know it's mostly fans um there are some like extremely optimistic media members and like as somebody who used to cover the team for a while i totally get why because that's you know you 
just inherently human nature like a lot of us want to see the good and want to be like yeah Mm -hmm. why they Mm -hmm. like him and this is why they think he's going to be good doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be good nick has been around long enough and and is connected enough and talks to enough personnel people when he makes an observation about like a guy being like no this this rookie who Mm -hmm. hasn't played a snap in the league looks like he might belong like i'm more inclined to believe it from nick really than than the vast majority of other people you see tweeting about this stuff and that's not a knock on anybody else because i've been there and i've i've been overly optimistic about players for sure like i wrote a blog post about quentin Patton during an off season after you know having six catches in a training camp practice being like can quentin Patton be the niners number two receiver like no just just wasn't gonna happen he was never good you enough, should but he had a good see practice. <laughs> the glowing glowing dante pettis posts <laughs> sprinkled across NinersWire.com from your boy. Yeah. So anyway, shout out to Nick. He's a uh, does a great job. I think he has an appropriate perspective when it comes to evaluating whether or not players are good, particularly offensive linemen. Yeah, and he won't he won't gas up players who who suck. I haven't seen him do that, and I've been around Nick for a while now. So shouts to him. Definitely big shots uh rookie who's not doing as well is isaac garendo who hurt his hamstring on the first day of practice not padded practice just first day of practice first day at camp injured his hamstring sounds like he's going to be out a few weeks and buddy (laughs) we're trending toward another 49ers running back selected in the third or fourth round uh being a mess and an undrafted guy coming in and leapfrogging him, Cody Schrader. Yeah, you got Mizzou's own Cotton Bowl champion, Cody Schrader, turning heads in camp, getting praise from from virtually every reporter who's who's on the ground at, at the SAP Performance Center. I will say everything good I just said about Nick, he completely loses all logic when it comes to Mizzou guys. I just want to point that out. It is Especially since favorite, they beat yeah. Ohio State in the Cotton Bowl. He's just any Mizzou guy, any whiff of – Mizzou Tigerdom, it's just all the ob- objectivity goes out the window. Speaking of that, real quick, Jake Moody, 18 of 19 on field goals. <laughs> um, no, where were we? Isaac Garendo. Uh, look, uh, it, it, Isaac Garendo, it, all the boxes pre draft, like checked. Raheem Mostert's name got invoked quite a bit with just his top end speed, his ability to to stay balanced through contact, uh, his his vision in finding the right hole particularly in in outside zone. He checks every single box to be a successful running back for the 49ers and he's on a 4-year contract and over the course over the life of that contract maybe he emerges as this just outstanding number 2 running back behind Christian McCaffrey. That is on the table. Um certainly hope he's he's healthy enough to give that a run. But the fact that on the first day of practice he hurt his hamstring and is going to be out multiple weeks, according to according to Kyle Shanahan, he said a few weeks, that doesn't bode well for a rookie running back, even a fourth round pick, who's trying to make a make a roster that let's say they keep four, it's Christian McCaffrey, Jordan Mason, Elijah Mitchell, and then one extra spot. You have Patrick Taylor, who's uh, been in the NFL for three years now and has played a ton of special teams and did some third down stuff for the Packers last year. You have Cody Schrader, Mizzou legend, who we just talked about, who's turning heads at camp now. I, Isaac Garendo is, has not only fallen behind the eight ball, but he's following further behind, especially as a first year player who, like, these reps are super valuable in getting up to speed just in the NFL and in the offense. And now he's missing out on those reps while the while the rest of the pack in front of him is is pulling away. It's just a really really tough spot for for him to be in in his first training camp. There's certainly time for him to bounce back and prove worthy of a roster spot and even a you know spot in the running back rotation. Um, but this is how like Cam Latu rookie seasons happen. This is how you know red shirt rookie seasons happen. It's like. Mm-hmm. Guy just can never get healthy, and then it ends up being a you know well this guy's he's put on IR before final cuts and it's just his season's a wrap before it starts and mm-hmm. you know knock on wood again he's he's got he's got some time to get it together um, but this is it's just not a good start and I think I mean that's the most fair way to say it right now it's just not a good start 
Um, so we'll see how it goes. But I mean, but what sucks for him and we joke about it, but like what sucks for him is media members and fans are going to look at the Niners history with like mid round running backs and be like, Oh, mm-hmm. happened again. And you know, it has nothing to do with him, <laughs> but mm-hmm. it's just, it's, it's the facts are the facts and that the 49ers have drafted a bunch of running backs in the middle of the draft. And then none of those guys have been productive. They've had three, mm-hmm. three running backs they drafted in what day, third, fourth, mm-hmm. third, fourth. Joe round. Williams, Trey Sermon, and Ty Davis Price. Yeah. And all of those guys have gotten supplanted by guys who were, well, they got supplanted by Christian McCaffrey, but also by, <laughs> uh, by, by guys. Can you believe? Later. Can you believe or, that idiot who got supplanted by Christian McCaffrey? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he made all of them expendable, <laughs> or at least TDP. But yeah, point stands. Like yeah. so, that that sucks. Or Grando, hope, hope, hopefully he gets healthy. The other yeah, one too we got to mention is is Drake Jackson. <sighs> um. So it turns out it sounded like he had the uh, the surgery that Weston Richburg and Mike McGlinchey had. Mm -hmm. and that was he had tendons that disconnected from his his thigh or his quadriceps to his knee um and that ended up being you know a pretty substantial recovery kyle shanahan said and and i'm not sure if this was followed up on or or not but kyle shanahan said it's unlikely drake jackson participates in camp um some coaches call the first two weeks of camp like a camp camp Mm-hmm. And then it turned as a pers- as the preseason sort of gets into regular swing, they just call it practice. Mm. I don't know if that you know it, it sounds like a long term thing the way the way Shannon talks about it, but I don't know if that means you know we're not going to see Drake Jackson at all in August, like before the season starts, right? Or if it's just going to be like yeah, we'll see him maybe before the third preseason game or something. Um, so we'll we'll try to. I'll try to track down some of that information and, and relay it when I have it, but that's not a good sign for Drake Jackson. The yeah. good news is that it seems like uh, Yuturgros Matos has been good mm-hmm. um, early on and that uh, Leonard Floyd has also been good early on for whatever that's worth. Um, yeah. But it seems like Drake Jackson might be, you know, it's a big year for him, obviously entering year three. And if he's not healthy enough to play, it's going to be hard to figure. It's yeah, going to be hard brutal. to find him a roster spot because he hasn't been yeah. good enough in the past to warrant one. Yeah, it's tough. At really least. tough spot for Drake Jackson. Hope he gets right though. Maybe it is a thing where once he gets into the preseason, that's what Kyle Shanahan meant. But um, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, man. Talented, talented guy. Uh, you want to get wanna talk about DJ Moore's contract? Another wide receiver yeah. got paid. Just thought it was notable. DJ Moore, who's had four 1,000 yard seasons, um, he got he had two years left on his deal. I don't know why the Bears did this, um, such but he an, got a such an odd thing. He got a four year, 110 million dollar extension. Uh, we did the math on that. That's what 27 and a half million dollars a year on average. Yeah. Um, beginning in what 2026. I kind of get. I think I get it, and I'm. Uh, I, follow me on this, or at least I hope you're going to follow me on this because I know I know you have thoughts. But I actually think this is smart by Chicago to get this deal on the books now, where you can structure that extension. I haven't seen the the structure yet, as we know that's vital. But you can structure that extension now where it's the 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 heaviest cap hits come while Caleb Williams is still on his rookie contract. And you get DJ Moore, who could be a perennial thousand thousand yard guy for you and an offensive weapon for twenty seven and a half million dollars a year in a receiver market that is exploding. So there's a chance that by twenty twenty six we're looking at DJ Moore making twenty seven and a half million and going, that is a bargain for Chicago. Yeah, I think that that's probably the best argument for it. Um, my worry would be that it's just, you know, the friend of the pod, Courtney Cronin, uh, his, in her ESPN story said the deal includes 82.6 million guaranteed, which ranks third for a wide receiver 
on a single contract in NFL history. Um, I don't know if those are practical guarantees. They're probably practical guarantees, not necessarily like fully mm-hmm. guaranteed at signing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm just leery of giving of committing that much money so far down the road when you don't know if in two years that player is going to be worth it. Yeah, is is would be my only fear. But I'm guessing like the guarantees are like, yeah, if he's if he's on the roster April 12th, then it's guaranteed. Where you know you can just cut them or trade them, um, you know before that guarantee hits, and you know that's quote unquote guaranteed money, so you can get out from underneath it. I would imagine that's what it is, um, but I, I just thought it was worth noting because you know DJ Moore been in the league since 2018. Um, like I said, he's had four 1,000 yard seasons, including 96 catch, 1,364 yard season last year with eight touchdowns. Um, and he might not be purely as efficient as Brandon Ayuk when, you know, yards per route run and yards per reception and all of those things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact he got what looks to be $27.5 million a year in a world where Brandon Ayuk could be asking 30, Mm -hmm. it just, it just seems like the market might not like, I don't know that the market's necessarily saying that Brandon Ayuk is a $30 million a year receiver. And I'm guessing that the 49ers would probably agree with that and would probably feel better about paying him, you know, 26, 27, 28 rather than 30. Yeah, I would agree. I keep expecting this to get done any day now. I wonder how much the Trent Williams stuff is, has kind of been a wrench they weren't necessarily expecting. Maybe. I have no idea. It's tough to say. It is. It is very tough to say. Maybe we're going to ask around on Sunday. Talk to our sources. Talk to our guys. Um, all right. I got nothing else. I got I nothing. saw DJ, DJ Moore signing that contract within the neighborhood that Brandon Ayuk is probably looking for was notable considering his resume versus Ayuk's. And- yeah, man. <clears throat> I got, if, if Ayuk's still looking, if he's not going to play until he gets $30 million a year, then he may never play again. I mean, that's... I mean, that's that's kind of the thing. Like, I think the Niners might dig in and then they're like, yeah, how about we fully guarantee you, you know, twenty eight million dollars this year? Sure. And then. But maybe that's something that Brandon Ayuk digs his heels on as well and Mm -hmm. doesn't sign until, you know, like Nick, the time Nick Bosa did the Wednesday before the season opener or the Thursday before the season opener in this case. Yeah. And then doesn't have a great year because he didn't have training camp. Maybe, I would. would I would be. also say. I would also say. Well, I'm going to say Brandon Ayuk has to be reasonable and and kind of. I think if the 49ers have an offer of like 25 a year on the table, I think they would also need to be reasonable and and be willing to come up a little bit from that. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So, but they also might be like, well, we're going to have to pay Brock Purdy 60 million dollars a year next year. Anytime and, you can, anytime you can give sixty million American dollars to a quarterback, and then not make sure his favorite receiver is on the team, you do it. That's what yeah. I've often said. That's just team I just, building one on one. Right. the The point here is that they have they have a championship window to try to keep open. Yeah. And three guys to sign between Brandon Ayuk. Trent Williams and Brock Purdy, three mm-hmm. of their most important players on offense. Um, while they're currently, I haven't checked today, but last time I checked, they were $38 million above the salary cap projection for 2025. It's fine. So, salary cap's fake. <laughs> good luck to Parag Marate on trying to figure this whole thing out. It'll um, be fun. It's going to be tough. All right. Subscribe, rate, review wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Candlestick Chronicles podcast. Or you can search Candlestick Chronicles on YouTube. You can find us there as well. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the thumbs up. Hit the little notification bell so you know when we're going live. We would appreciate the heck out of that. Thank you, everybody, for listening and or watching. And we'll talk to you next week. See Not next week, next time. We'll be back this week. Hopefully. Unless you're listening next week. <laughs>